Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on automatic enrollment. Um, there are a few more people to join us, uh, but we're going to start the webinar now anyway, rather than keep you waiting. So on the, the webinar today, we have Darren Amos. He's a financial planner at Anst Co. Myself, Greg Guilford, the CEO at HR Solutions. And those of you who have been uh, on our previous webinars will recognize Alison Blackhurst, who is our HR knowledge manager. So the purpose of today is um, that this webinar is going to be aimed at providing you with an overview of workplace pensions and auto-enrollment. Uh, we shall be reminding you of the options available to you, remind you of your duties, and we'll also be trying to provide you some support as well so that we will have the option for you to ask us some questions. Um, you will be able to do this via your GoToMeeting control panel, uh, and we will attempt to answer all of these at the end of the webinar. However, if we do not get to answer your question, then we will come back to you at the end of the webinar. So now I'm going to hand you over to Darren, who's going to talk you through um, the rest of the webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Darren. Thanks for listening. Right, first of all, uh, workplace pensions and auto enrollment. Very topical thing this year because in the next 12 months, over 850,000 small employers like yourselves will be in, as we say, um, and those numbers are growing rapidly. And this is all to do with a phasing in of auto enrollment until 2018, when every company by then will have that. You'll have seen this advert on the telly with the irritating big bear thing. Not quite sure what it's meant to be, but worky. Reminding employers not to ignore the workplace pension because it's something that can't, won't, will not go away. And so every person, every company in the UK will be going through this process. And this graph gives you an idea. It's, it's actually this year and next year. And as you can see, the numbers are rapidly growing. If you look towards sort of July 17, we're talking about over 100,000 companies in one month going through the process of auto-enrollment. And that goes up even higher in October and November. So in 12 months' time, 130-odd thousand companies per month will be doing this. And obviously that's quite a strain on the whole system for providers and you know, make it much harder for you as employers to find a suitable scheme and advice as, as to which scheme is appropriate for your business. So I'd urge you to sort of look sooner rather than later. So what is auto enrollment? Well, it brings a bit a string of employer duties. Um, most important one for the starting point is for you to find out when your staging date is. So that's an action point for yourself. Register with the pensions regulator. Um, you have to provide details of your workforce. That's every employee, big or small, no matter what they earn. Whether they qualify for the pension or not, they all have to be advised. And then once a scheme's selected and up and running past your staging date, which is different for every company, you then have to complete a declaration of compliance. This is five months after your staging date. And that's very important because a lot of people are forgetting to do that bit and that's where they're getting fined by the pension regulator. So it will be part of the process. But first of all, you need to ensure you have a suitable qualified, what we call a qualifying scheme. That's a scheme that meets all of the criteria of auto-enrollment, and that actually probably precludes any existing company scheme that you have. It may need some changes to be made to make it a qualifying scheme for auto-enrollment purposes, or that may be what we used to call a qualifying scheme before we had auto-enrollment. You then have to assess all of your staff, this is on your, from your staging date onwards, and your staging date is different for each company. Assess your staff, and then automatically enroll certain workers, and these are the ones that are, meet the criteria for auto-enrollment. You then have to have also available membership of a pension scheme for all the other workers that didn't quite qualify. And some of the, some, for some people that will be the same scheme, and for others it might be a different scheme as well you set up. So it's much more complicated than it used to be. Then, as with any company pension scheme, you'll be looking to take member contributions from their salary, and you must pay those contributions on time to the provider, and that's actually a legal requirement, and you can actually be fined if you make late payments. So it's, once it's taken from the member, it must be paid to the scheme within a certain number of days. But the biggest thing, probably for most employers, is the fact they must also now contribute to that scheme. There are, there's a set number of contribution levels, and you must comply with that as an employer, from your staging date onwards, you must pay into that scheme for all members.
So ongoing, once you've actually got your scheme up and running, it doesn't stop there. This is the problem with auto enrollment. It's a, it's a forever thing. First of all, there will be people who say they, they do not want to be in the scheme. They will want to opt out. Must make it clear they cannot not join the scheme. They must join the scheme on your own, as auto enroll applies to them. They can then, once they have received their members pack from the provider, they will then have the option to choose to opt out. It's not a simple process. It's deliberately made awkward. And you as an employer cannot get involved in that. You are then notified by the pension scheme that this person has opted out, and then you have to process that opt out and remove them from the scheme at your end on the payroll. You must reassess every single staff member every single pay period. All the ones that are already in, all the ones that have not joined at the moment, everybody must be assessed. And that's because the criteria is based around age and their age and their wage, so they may not have qualified in the preceding pay period, but this period they may do. And that applies to someone, for example, who gets a bonus in one month, that might put them into the bracket of being auto-enrolled, and you have to auto-enroll them in the month that applies. So you have to show that you've reassessed every member of staff to make sure that doesn't happen, or that they haven't passed the relevant birthday to make them auto-enrolled, and keep those records for six years. And that's the next stage, keeping records with the assessment and opt-outs process, so you need to be able to prove if the pension regulator comes in to check on your data that you have all the information. And then approximately every three years, and it is only an approximation, because there's a window of six weeks either side, so it could be just under three years, you have to re-enroll re everybody that isn't already in the scheme, even the ones that chose to opt out. And that's on the third anniversary thereabouts of when your scheme happens. And that's going to happen again in the future going forwards. But first you must know when to act. So you need to find your particular staging date. And there's a web address there at the pension regulator. Um, it isn't difficult. You do need your payroll reference. You, you have to fill in some other bits probably, but it's very straightforward. Or you can simply ask us and we can do that for you because we've got those details already. The suggested time scale for this is a minimum of six months before your staging date, which obviously you need to know your staging date before you know how close you are to that. And many people are finding their staging dates sooner than they expected. And the pick, because choosing a pension and getting it all set up and presented properly and arranged will take at least four months. If you do it any less than that, you're not going to end up with a, with a, with a nice, simple process. It's going to get complicated for you, and they, that's when errors occur. So, brings us to the pensions regulator. These, these are there. They govern all of everything to do with auto enrollment, and they're there to, to make sure we all comply with the regulations. And they, they say within their, their, their blurb that they think small employers need a little nudge which in their terms means issuing a compliance notice. Unfortunately, these have been on the increase in the last few months. In the total to September 2016, which is effectively the first four years of auto-enrolment, 34,703 of those were issued, but 19,825 of that total were actually issued in the last three months. So you can see it's been really ramped up, and that's mainly because there's a lot more companies going through the process now than there were in the early years, because they were large employers. We're now talking about lots of small employers. With the vast majority of these compliance notices, notices over 15,000 in quarter three, most of them are compliance notices, which is just a slap on the wrist. 324 were unpaid contribution notices, which obviously is quite serious. You can get fined for that. That's where you've paid contributions late or haven't collected them. Nearly 4,000 were fixed penalty notices, which is a flat fee of £400. That's the first penalty that's charged. And then the next one is escalating penalty notices, and they've actually issued nearly 600 of those in the last quarter. And that's based on the size of your company. In a company with less than five staff, it's £50 per day until you correct the issue. With a larger company, i.e. six staff or more, it's at least £500 a day. And that's calendar days until you correct it from the day they start to apply it. So, But it's not surprising that people are getting it wrong, of course, because auto-enrollment itself is a complex process. It's The pension part of it is actually relatively simple. It's the administration that goes with it. You have to think about contribution phasing. This is where you're allowed to not start at the full contribution levels, and you can phase those in over the next 
two and a half years, um, up to April 19 now it's been extended. Um, but, but the phasing is set fixed amounts at certain dates, so you must comply with that and you as a company can decide not to use that phasing. There's also four different contribution levels. Most people think it's 8%, but it's actually 7, 8 or 9, and there are two different versions of the 8, so you need to make sure you're collecting contributions in the correct way. You can also utilize salary exchange within the process. There are four different ways to use salary exchange, or well, five you actually think about not using it, so that, that all these things add on the variations. And then which providers to use? Well, unfortunately, only master trust schemes, which I'll explain in a little while, actually are listed on the pension regulator site. Um, with all group pensions are actually listed on the Association of British Insurers site, the ABI site, except legal and generals because they've fallen out of the ABI, unfortunately. Um, but, but it doesn't really help you choose, it just lists them because they're not going to give you advice on which scheme is appropriate for your business. Just waiting for the next slide to appear. Oh, it's got, oh sorry, my, my screen was delayed by looking at it. Oh, how this might look if you get penalised when, when things go wrong. A well-known retailer, we won't say who it is, but if, you are, if you're interested, you can look it up on the pensions regulator state they're at the site, they are actually named. They failed to stage on the correct date. Now, you think that's unbelievable for a large company where they knew this was coming and they have their own pensions department, so if they can get it wrong, you can imagine how easy it is for a small business to get it wrong. And because of that, they were ordered to pay all of the missing contributions that the company should have paid, plus all of the members' contributions that should have been paid. So that cost them an additional 15000 to start with. They also failed to comply with the order to do so, so they got slapped with a £400 standard fine. And then they didn't comply then, and they were slapped with an escalating penalty, which was £2,500 per day because of the size of the company. That was after 40, after the first 28 days, they were told they won't be on 28 days, they would get fined £2,500 a day. They didn't actually respond, and so therefore the fine started to be applied, and four days later they complied when they realised how much it was costing them. So the total cost to them was over £25,000, just for ending up starting on the wrong date. And that's the sort of that's, a, that's the way the penalties apply. So marketplace, these are your options for the type of scheme you can have. What's out there? Well, basically there are two options. If you haven't got a, an old-fashioned company pension scheme, the most common being used now are either group personal pensions. These are actually per, just like your own personal pension would be, but the company buys in bulk, so they get a discount in charge and things. And these would use your well-known insurance companies like Aviva, Royal London, Legal and General, Liberal Victoria, all those sort of companies are well-known and very simple to administer, very straightforward. And then there are master trust schemes, which are something that people don't really understand the differential, but it's the way they, they collect the money effectively. There are currently well over 200 of these. Some of them are very small um, and some are very well-known, such as Nest, People's Pension, Now Pension, Smart Pension, they're probably the main providers, but there are some trusts being run by Legal in General, which is sort of a hybrid between what they normally do as a group personal pension and what they're doing as a master trust. So there's quite a lot of choice out there. Um, and you do have to be careful what you choose it, because master trusts are a new idea, really, primarily for auto-enrollment. So we have a master trust assurance framework accreditation. So if you're looking at master trust, you should look for that accreditation. If they haven't got it, it means they don't meet certain financial criteria for stability. Also look for a de facto star rating. De facto are the insurance industry rating system. And what you're looking for there is a five star. Um, if there's anything less than five star, it means they're not quite up to spec for whatever reason. And de facto ratings will quite clearly show what that is. But very few master trusts are actually rated five star. In fact, three of the current ones on the top 25 only achieve a two star de facto rating, yet their, MA, their master must trust assurance, assurance accredited. And one of those master trust assurance accredited ones only achieves one star. So I'm not sure which level of accreditation you want to take to, to be your guide, really. You'd be, ideally, I think I would look for somebody with the Master Trust Assurance Framework Accreditation and Five Star De Facto because you know they've been checked out by two totally different organisations and found to be up to spec. But that doesn't apply to many of the Master Trusts. So do be careful. 
In fact, Leslie Titcombe, who's the chief executive of the pension regulator, says she's actually concerned about whether some master trusts would survive, which puts members' pensions at risk. Um, this is actually up. This was several months ago, and actually, as of last week, new regulations were put in place based upon this, specifically to protect people with regard to master trusts. So, watch this space because we don't know what changes will be made yet. So, once you've made your decision, you'd have to think about the costs. Obviously, you've got your contribution levels, but nearly every provider in the market, no matter whether it's a master trust or a group personal pension, will be charging you as an employer for using their pension. It must be clear this is not a charge being applied by the advisors so they've got an income coming from you forevermore. It's actually direct to the provider and covers the cost of using their platforms. And that varies. You know, this uh, now pensions are one of the master trusts are paying £36 a month fixed, but obviously they do reserve the right to increase that in the future. That's irrespective of the number of people in the scheme. Creative, another one, are saying £20 a month. Aviva, on the group personal pension side, could charge up to £800 just to set the scheme up. And also a charge in monthly fees from £25 a month upwards, and that depends on the size of the scheme. Royal London, another big provider in the market, are charging anything between 25 and 75 pounds per month. But the good news is they do only charge it for the first three years. Obviously, that might change. But with the right scheme and with the right negotiation from a from an accredited advisor, that could be waived completely. And if it is, obviously, they'll never be applied. People's Pension, yet another one of the master trusts, don't charge any monthly fees, but charge a 500 pound upfront fee. Standard Life, one of the very major players, anybody who's had company pension schemes in the past will be very aware of Standard Life in that market, are now charging £100 per month, irrespective of the size of the scheme, forever, which is quite an expensive charge. So currently, the only major provider not charging anybody is Nest, which everybody refers to as the government scheme. It's actually um, backed by the government to ensure it exists so that everybody has a scheme they can log, they can use, um, but it's not actually a government scheme, it's still, still a separate company and will eventually have to make its own profits. So at the moment, they're not making any charges, that could change. So let's talk about some other things. Some of you will be very small businesses, directors only, perhaps, very com a lot of confusion around this particular area. Um, if you have a contract but no other eligible employees, i.e. there's just you or you and a spouse perhaps and you pay them negligible amount just for tax purposes, as many people do, then there's no auto-enrollment. But you do have to be careful because if you've got a contract and then take on an, em an employee with, that's eligible, that, that meets the criteria, not only do you have to auto-enroll that member, but you also have to auto-enroll the director at the same time because they have a contract. So you now have two employees, effectively. But a director who hasn't got a contract, irrespective of how many staff they have, would never be auto-enrolled. So contract of services is, is key here. So you do have to be careful about the contracts in place. Most small businesses with a contract with a director wouldn't have a contract, so that's probably not an issue, but it does have. But you must remember you will still have the same staging date for your business. You still have to do the assessments on a regular basis of the staff you haven't got. You can register to be exempted if it's definitely only you. Um, there's a link there which obviously, as you know, it's got a weird address at the beginning of it. So if you search the pensions regulator, you won't find that particular link. You have to go to automation first. But you will find that link. There's a simple form to fill in. You make the declaration that it is only you or that you had staff, but you no longer have staff. There are various options. Once you've decided which one's correct, click the box. This pension regulator will, will register the, the fact you've done that, and you will not be hassled about your compliance rules again. But bear in mind, the minute that anything changes, you must notify them. So what? let's talk about some other bits and pieces. First of all, who's eligible? Well, pretty much everybody. If you think the top right hand, top left hand corner there, anybody who's between 22 and the state pension age, which obviously we know moves a little bit at the moment, so pretty much 67 at the moment, 22 to 67, 
and they earn the £833.33 in a month if you're paid monthly. It's actually 10,000 a year the trigger. Most people read that as 10,000 pounds a year, but it, it would actually trigger auto enrollment if any member of staff who was currently on 9,000 pounds a year earned more than 833 pounds in one month because they would then be deemed to be worth earning the equivalent of 10,000 pounds a year. So there your people are eligible. They're the people that are automatically enrolled. So pretty much nearly every member of staff. You then have people who are between 22 and state pension age but are working part of home perhaps and earning less than the 833. They, that's what we call non-eligible. And the people under 22 or over state pension age, but earning over, so they're earning enough to be qualified, but they're actually outside the 22 to state pension age band, so they're younger or older, they're also non-eligible. Now those two categories, non-eligible, are actually allowed to say to you, we want to be auto-enrolled. And if they do that, you cannot say no. You must treat them as if they're in the first category. You must contribute on their behalf at the same rate as you would do if they were eligible, uh, and everything else applies. It must be the same scheme, your normal auto enrollment scheme. And in the bottom right-hand corner, we've got a slightly unusual scenario, which is probably not going to apply to many people. They're under 22 or over state pension age, and also don't earn enough to qualify as non-eligible. They become entitled. Now these people, it's a bit more difficult because they have the right to demand to join a pension scheme. But you don't have to enrol them in your auto-enrolment scheme. And if you don't do that, then you don't have to contribute. They, they're allowed to contribute to their own pension, but you don't have to. There is a bit of a flaw in this because that means you have to set up a second pension scheme, stakeholder pension, whatever it might be. But the minute that person, particularly if they're under 22, becomes 22, they would bounce into the other scheme automatically because they'd be auto-enrolled. And now you've got two schemes they're members of, and they probably then have difficulty moving the, the little amount they've amassed in the current scheme across to the new scheme, which would be the right thing for them to do, possibly. And they're going to be a bit confused. It gets a bit messy. I'd be more inclined to say to you as a company, despite the bullet, if you've got an employee in that category who says, I'd like to join the pension, put them in your auto-enrolment scheme and, and pay, treat them as if they're auto-enrolled. That's probably your easiest way of doing it. Otherwise, you're going to have to have two separate schemes in place. And they will always grow out. If they're under 22, they're definitely going to grow out of that group in, if it, at some point in the future. Or if they're earning less than £10,000, they will at some point in the future have a pay rise that takes over that. But if you've got a if you have no one eligible, let's assume they're all non-eligible, you've got loads of people earning less than £10,000 a year or they're all under 22 or over 67, right? you, you might think there's no need to set up a scheme. But you might still need to because they can insist on joining, as I say, and they might change category by age or wage. Or what if you then, if you've got no employees, you're a single director and company, past your staging date, what if you now want to take on a new member of staff? you must be able to put them into a pension scheme the day they start work. If you're past your staging date, so which will be everybody in two years' time, so after two years' time, automatically all new companies and all new staff will be auto-enrolled. So you must have that facility to do it, because if you don't, you're non-compliant the day they start. There is something called postponement, some of you may have heard of, and that allows you to postpone people, particularly those whose pay for one period takes them over the threshold but normally wouldn't do, you can have a system automatically in place that says, if that happens, we'll postpone them for a month, so we'll check them again next month, and if they don't qualify next month, they're not auto-enrolled. But you can't do that if you haven't got a scheme to put them in, because they could say, no, I don't want to be postponed. Auto-enrollment applies to all staff employed by you, as you'd expect, but what people don't realise, it also includes people that are deemed workers. This might include contractors you use on a regular basis, or people that are referred to as personal services workers, which are people who would regard themselves as self-employed, but if they come to you on a regular basis to do your IT or whatever it might be, and you expect them to turn up every Monday and work nine to five, that sort of thing, then they would be deemed to work for you for one day a week. And therefore, if, they, if you pay them more than the £833 a month, and they're over 22, you must 
auto enroll them into your pension scheme even though they're not actually an employee that's where it's going to get very vague in the future there are lots of contracts out there um, and the definitions for whether those people are self-employed are not the same definition as HMRC has so you might have somebody who's definitely self-employed pays their own tax etc no issue at all from HMRC's perspective the pension regulator sees them as an as a deemed worker for you so it's not the same as an employee it's a deemed worker and you must include deemed workers so finally who are NC and Co obviously I've been waffling on a while um, we are actually a directly authorized independent financial advisor obviously known as IFAs normally um, I'm we are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority we provide advice on pensions investments life assurance and health insurances to employers and employees and we also provide a full mortgage advice service to anybody that wants it so that's us um, and if you need to speak to any of us you're welcome as part of this to actually speak to us directly we're here to help you with those areas so that's me Darren Amos my contact details there and we're pretty much there and ready to answer questions thank you Darren um, so I think Alison's um, been collating some of the questions for us, so uh, I'm going to pass you over to Alison who's going to read out the questions for us whilst uh, Darren answers them for us. Yes, good afternoon. And uh, needless to say, we do have a range of questions. I've tried to select the ones that will apply to most of the people listening into this seminar. And as we said earlier, um, ones that are particularly unique to you, we will actually reply to you later on. Um, but the first one is an interesting one, Darren, because um, I don't know the answer to this, and I didn't know whether you needed a crystal ball in order to answer it. But um, somebody said, well, it's all very well. Nest is free now, but will there be a fee later on? Now, do we have any government guarantees on that? There are no guarantees whatsoever. It's, it's already been muted that Nest will charge a fee. Um, they currently don't need to because the taxpayer are basically covering all their costs. Um, but they are expected to be a profitable entity in their own right within five years of the start starting point. So there is a point in the future where profitability will be such they will need to start charging fees just as other providers have done. There were no fees at all when auto enrollment started and now everybody's charging fees. Goodness so I would expect it to happen. If they do that, I mean, is it actually easy to change your pension provider because you don't like the costs that they're bringing in or are you actually stuck with that scheme? Um, it's, it's relatively easy to change, um, but changing from A to B is not always going to be seamless um, because the, particularly if you're choosing a different, if you're going from Nest, which is a master trust, to something else which might be a group personal pension, you have to then qualify for that particular provider's criteria for your business. There are many businesses who will not be eligible for those other schemes. Right, and I understand that quite a lot of schemes have actually refused to take particular employers if they don't have sufficient numbers and this sort of thing as well, is that right? That, that's, that's right, yeah. it's all about profitability for all of them because obviously they are businesses at first and foremost um, and if they've got a scheme with three members currently earning £11,000 a year, the contribution levels are literally a couple of hundred pounds a year, that's not profitable for a business. So they yes. that's why they're charging fees or they're saying we're not even interested even with a fee, the, the fee would have to be so large it would be worth you doing. Oh, so sorry, Kathy, who asked that question. <laughs> um, I hope the crystal ball's enough for you there. Um, okay, a question from Sue now. Can we contribute more than the statutory minimum? Theoretically, yes. Um, there is no. It is. It, that's the whole point. It's a statutory minimum. There is a minimum requirement that the len, that the employer and employee must contribute. Now, the minimum is set based on the contribution levels for that scheme. Um, for most schemes it will be 8% and the employer is committed to at least 3% of that but the employer could put all 8% if they wish to, the member can put anything on top of that if they wish to. The problem is that a lot of schemes themselves, the actual providers, haven't built that option into the scheme. So whilst the law says you can and theoretically you can, a lot of schemes actually are set up to be very basic and therefore don't allow any variation to what's legislation. Um, so, that, so if you want to, and to be fair, some of the schemes are so poor in quality that as a member, you should maximise what you can get out of your company by joining it. Otherwise, you don't get your three percent from your company. But then, if you were looking to put more than that, and you may well want to talk to an advisor and set up a scheme on the side of that for your own money, where it's actually going to be more beneficial. Thank you. 
Okay, David says um, they have a stakeholder scheme already in place um, and they pay in 3% of their employees' salaries. Um, the employees can pay in as little or as much as they like, up to 6%. Will, can they stay with that scheme or do they need to provide anything else? They, the scheme itself would probably be qualifying uh, on that basis as, a, as employers meeting its commitment. The members would, however, not have the same flexibility going forwards as staging dates pass. They will end up having to pay a minimum of five percent. So, the five to six percent is the only is the only variation they can have there. But the reality of that is, even though it's probably okay, it doesn't meet lots of the other criteria for auto enrollment. One of which is that it must automatically have the facility to auto enroll, and no existing scheme prior to auto enrollment i.e. stakeholder schemes, will not have a facility to automatically enroll, which means that the employer will have to have some kind of add-on software that, and a very manualized process where mistakes can be made. And from a member's perspective, stakeholder schemes typically charge between 1 and 1.5% 1 .1 annual management charges to the membership. If you go for a proper auto-enrollment scheme, it's got to be less than 0.75%. So you're actually being detrimental to your members, perhaps, to keep the stakeholder running. So, in fact, are most people tending to um, discontinue with their previous stakeholder schemes? They are. They're looking at an alternative of a similar nature, perhaps, because they've got a stakeholder that would come under the group personal pension type option, um, something similar to that, but probably that's geared more to auto-enrollment, so it can be used for auto-enrollment straight away. And then you could consider a block transfer if the membership wish it into, from their stakeholder pension into the new scheme, so they could benefit from the lower charging structure and all their current investments as well. All right. Actually, that, that ties up with another question that we got here from Sharon, who is considering setting up the Nest scheme for their employees. Um, and yeah. most of them had personal pension arrangements at the moment, so um, presumably it could well be a stakeholder scheme, yes. Will they yeah. be able yeah. to transfer funds from their current scheme into the new Nest scheme? Um, at the moment, not at all. Uh, Nest specifically doesn't allow transfers. It is going to in the future, um, but the charging structure on NIST is a little bit different to every other scheme in that they charge a monthly fee plus a percentage of the fund, whereas all the others only charge a percentage of the fund, so it's not quite as clear cut. So if you were looking to transfer your existing stakeholder scheme, for example, into NIST, you would need to speak to an advisor to assess whether it's actually better, a better deal for you or not. Because that is the key, is whether your existing schemes, options, the performance of the funds, the choice of investments and the charging structure might actually be better than Nest would be. And so you would have to be very cautious about transferring into something like Nest at the moment until it's expanded itself properly. Right. Okay, I'm sorry to put you on the spot here. This probably feels like question time, <laughs> doesn't it? But, um, one I'm interested in here, um, this comes from Kelly, and um, she says that they have always tied in benefits like PMI and the membership of the pension scheme with successful completion of employees' probationary periods. Um, so yes. are they still able to access their scheme? Now, they have three different probationary periods. They have some on a month's probation, some on three months, and also some on six months. So can they limit access to the scheme only to the employees who have satisfactorily completed their probationary period? Unfortunately not. Um, the, the legislation says that on your staging date, so once you've gone past your staging date, if we, if we assume you've now staged and you have this in place, then every member of staff that is eligible for auto-enrollment must be auto-enrolled. So you cannot have someone who started with you who's over 22 and earns more than £10,000. The day they start work, they should be auto-enrolled. That's obviously not practical for most businesses because apart from else, you need the, the member needs to know that's going to happen and all the rest. So it would be quite commonplace for companies to, to utilise the facility known as postponement. And that will give you the option to say, Automatically, every new member of staff will be postponed for three months or two months or whatever it might be. So yes, you could cover your first initial probationary period with that, but you can't actually make it a contractual thing because actually anybody who's postponed for any reason can say no thank you. 
I want to join the scheme. And so when you when you when your new member of staff joins and, and I would expect this to become much more commonplace in the future when they will have come from a company that have a scheme already, because in the future everybody will have will have a scheme, so they'll know that they have a scheme. Yeah. If you're if you've been in a, a scheme already and just joined your new company, as we all do moving on for something better, you're not gonna wanna be three months without a contribution into your pension. So you you're gonna say, No, no thank you, I wanna join today. I expect to still be here in three months after my probation anyway. That that's not I didn't join the company with the intent of leaving and I'm hoping you accept that I'm good at what I do. And so if they are able to say no or want to join today and you have to tell them that on the day they join and you postpone them, then obviously quite clearly in the contract you can't say you can't join. Right. So the contract could say we will auto we will auto enroll you auto, you know, automatically after three months, um, or on the on the completion of your probationary period, providing it's it, no more than three months. But if you want to join earlier, you can do so. Yes, in line, but you'd have to make sure you're using the, the correct wording as laid down by the legislation to, regarding the postponement. It must be quite clear what the, that the client has the option, that the member has the option to join immediately, and that yeah. it's postponement. It's, that they are auto, they're actually auto enrolled on the first day. But you've postponed them. It's kind of the other way around. So you must make sure. Right. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Well, I think we've put you on the spot enough for today. We do have some more questions, but as I said, we'll um, we will answer people individually on those. Um, but just one last one that I must cover again um, is a question to say, please may we have Darren's contact details again? So would you like to give those, Darren, or do you want me to read those out? Oh yes, I'm happy to give them. I, my yeah. direct number is it always looks a bit jumbled on the screen, is zero seven nine four seven one three five four nine seven. That's zero seven nine four seven one three five four nine seven. Um and my email is Darren D A R R E N at Anstico. That's Alpha November Sierra Tango Echo Echo Charlie Oscar dot co dot UK. And I'm sure those contact details were made available by HR Solutions. Should anybody want them anyway? But thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for attending. We're going to close the webinar now. Um, there, there are a few people who do want some other questions uh, answered, but we will come back to you separately. Um, but thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you on some of our future webinars as well.